Assalamu alaikum everyone. You are listening to episode 37 of the Muhammad Ghailan podcast with yours truly as the host. Before we get into today's subject, just a quick announcement for Andalus Book Club members. The video for uh, part one, my commentary on part one of Soul Machine, The Invention of the Modern Mind by George Macari, uh, the book that we're covering this month in the book club, is now up and available for you to go and watch, um, along with a PDF of the PowerPoint presentation for those of you who would like to have it. So you can go to the video section and check out Soul Machine for part one video. If you haven't been keeping track, the introduction was uploaded last week. So now there are two videos for you to get through, um, and soon you'll have three more coming your way. So hopefully you'll get through that before the live webinar. We're looking to have a lively discussion on consciousness, free will, intelligence, and all these subject matters. Uh, of course, if you're not a member of Endless Book Club, you can become a member by going to endlessonline.org and just follow the links and join the fun. Um, now, with regards to today's topic... Um, I'm not going to be giving you clear-cut, definitive answers on it because the fact is nobody really has clear-cut, definitive answers. Um, there, are some th there are some ideas, there is some direction to go with it. It's a subject that has been debated and discussed by plenty of people since eons. And so I'm under no illusion uh, or delusion that I'm going to come all of a sudden and give you the answers to it. But I want to. what I want to do, though, is offer you some thoughts about it, maybe give you some, I don't know, some direction, some things to think about um, with regards to it. And the subject is, as if you've read the title of the episode, is Human Nature and the Fitrah. The Fitrah is this Islamic concept um, that was... Uh, introduced or outlined by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Prophet Muhammad, uh, in the narration of uh, a famous hadith that is often quoted that we'll go through in a second, and it's also mentioned in the Qur'an. Now, the beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in this hadith, which is often misinterpreted, مَا مِن مَوْلُودٍ إِلَّا يُولَدُ عَلَى الْفِطْرَةِ فَأَبَوَاهُ يُهَوِّدَانِهِ أَوْ يُنَصِّرَانِهِ أَوْ يُمَجِّسَانِهِ That every newborn... There's no newborn that is born except that they are born upon what he called the fitrah. Then their parents make them into a Jew, a Christian, or a Magian. Now, it's very difficult to translate some of these concepts from Arabic into English. And the reason for that is because they encompass so many different ideas underneath them um, that it becomes almost a disservice to try to choose one word. So oftentimes what I do with a word like the fitra is I'll give you what this concept stands for. And what I usually say it stands for this innate natural dispensation that every person has towards recognizing what is good, what is true, what is pure, uh, what is holy. It's just an innate instinct that we have towards recognizing that thing. Um, but that doesn't really get the whole picture here. Um, and so that's really what we want to talk about today. Now, if you look at the Arabic word fitra and look at the linguistics of it, there are multiple meanings. But for us here, for what is for our purposes, the meaning that we're talking about, it entails original creation. Fatara, the root word for it, the three letters, fatara, means to originate something. It's talking about the first characteristic or the first feature that describes a creation at the moment it is brought into existence before the influence of environment takes its place upon that thing that is being created. Now, some scholars have explained in the con that in the context of this hadith, it indicates the readiness, there is this general state of preparedness, to accept guidance and recognize faith as a natural state that results in one having harmony with the rest of creation. There is this understanding in the Islamic tradition that everything in creation is in a state of submission to its Lord, except for the human being. The human being was granted this free will to willingly and consciously choose to submit to their Lord. Now, Having this understanding should shed light on the way that this hadith is often mistranslated and also misunderstood by many Muslims. For a while, back in, back in the day, 
there used to be this debate, and some people still have it nowadays, but it's off, you know, mostly died down. But it used to be a big deal uh, for people that accept Islam, that adopt Islam as their faith. Uh, what do you refer to them as? Are they converts or are they reverts? And there is a lot of very strong opinions about this back in the day, about, no, they should be reversed because every newborn is born a Muslim. This is the natural religion of mankind. That's not what the hadith is actually saying, though. It's quite interesting, and this was also discussed by some of the scholars, that the Prophet wasallam does not mention Islam as a thing that is projected onto or imposed upon the child. The Prophet ﷺ merely says that you're born in this state of fitrah, this natural state, and then your parents introduce these ideas to you. So there is this idea that these theologies that get introduced to you, they're not necessarily your natural state of being. You have to take them on. And it was, in, it was inferred from that that Islam is this natural religion. It's going to be the, na- the one that you naturally will attra- be attracted to. And the reason for that is because it all makes sense. And so it was deduced from that that naturally you're going to be a Muslim. The thing is, as a newborn, that's not the case. As a newborn, you don't have a religion, Islamically speaking. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does say in the Quran in uh, Surah Al-Nahl, وَاللَّهُ أَخْرَجَكُم مِّن بُطُونِ أُمَّهَاتِكُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ شَيْئًا وَجْعَلَ لَكُمُ السَّمْعَ وَلَا بُصَارَ وَلَا فِئِدَةَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ That, and God has brought you forth from the wombs of your mothers, you did not know anything. And he gave you hearing and sight and hearts that you may give thanks. In other words, there's this understanding that when you were born, you were basically a blank slate. You didn't know anything. And you were given these tools, sight, intellect, hearing, to perceive information and to rationalize and to understand and to gain knowledge. And that's when you adopt ideologies and adopt all of these things. But when it comes to fitrah, God Almighty says in Surah Al-Rum, فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ حَنِيفًا فِطْرَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي فَطَرَ النَّاسَ عَلَيْهَا لَا تَبْدِيلَ لِخَلْقِ اللَّهِ ذَلِكَ دِينُ الْقَيِّمُ وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ that sets your face upright for religion in the right state. And so this is where the understanding that Islam is the religion of the fitrah, that you're being called to to accept, to adopt, to establish this religion that is going to be bringing you into this natural state of harmony with your Lord. And that's the nature that God has by which made man. There is no altering in God's creation, as the verse says, and this is the right religion, but most people do not know. The thing is, when you engage in these discussions, revert, convert, the thing about becoming a, you know, choosing which way to go, I personally don't accept the term revert because if you reflect on what it means to be a revert or when that term is used, it's often used in terms of passive regression towards a state that may be or may not be correct. For example, when I go to the gym, and um, right now I'm, I'm trying to fix my squats because I'm just I'm, I'm overcompensating on one side. My, my muscles are not activating the way they should be. I wasn't stretching as properly as I should be. I, I needed to adjust some things, and even my form itself was a bit flawed. And what that resulted in was giving me some knee pains. So I had to drop the weights down. I had to just become more engaged and conscious in the way that where my hips and my knees break so that I can maintain my posture properly and go through the movement in the way that it should be. And when I do that, I don't have knee pains anymore. But I do notice when I go a bit too heavy, I get too excited and I care more about moving the weight, my body reverts to old habits that it was doing and I get the knee pain back again. So I have to drop it down and fix it and adjust because I need to rewire my nervous system in a way that it knows this is the way that you need to move before you can increase the weights and get to where you want to get to. Whereas, and that's a conscious state, that's me converting my body. So the same thing when it comes to religion. I mean, if you think about it, people that adopt Islam, they took a conscious decision. They thought about it. They researched. They did a lot of work for you to eventually say, you've reverted, you've done a passive thing. No, there was a conscious effort going into all of that. Moreover, a proper understanding of the hadith that you're not necessarily, you might be born in a state of submission when you're born, when you don't have free will yet, and you're just a little toddler baby, didn't know anything. 
but you didn't know anything. And once you have the environment impose things on you and start to alter you and give, and condition you socially, and you start to pick up social conventions, now you got a different thing. And so you have to consciously adopt this religion. You cannot strip people's free will away from that. Well, that's just a tangent on uh, on the side uh, with regards to this subject. Now, when we talk about the fitrah, as I mentioned, we're talking about this state of readiness. You're in a state of preparedness to recognize certain things. And the scholars, the Muslim scholars said that the fitrah has two qualities. For something to be called a fitrah, it has to fulfill two things. The first one is that it's not acquired from culture or through education or even contemplation. In other words, this has to be something that is natural, innate to you, that is you know, that is um, uh, you did not pick up from anywhere. And moreover, the second quality, which is linked to that, that is present in all people, irrespective of their background. So it's a universal feature. It's not something that you can sit back and contemplate intellectually. Many of us think about contemplation or thought as it's either you're being rational or irrational, you're being logical or illogical. But there is this third aspect of human intelligence, which is the non-rational aspect. And it's increasingly uh, recognized in uh, neuroscience, interestingly enough, because the nervous system is not restricted just to your brain and your spinal cord, and that's where it sits, or your thought process is not restricted to your brain alone. Um, if you think about what is the first thing, if you go with an evolutionary paradigm, what is the function of the nervous system initially? What's the purpose of it? It's to move your limbs around. It's to move your body around. It's to react to the environment. The first thing that actually evolved for your, for your brain function, and which is where the majority of your neurons actually reside, is in your cerebellum. It's all about movement. It's about balance. And so there is this idea of an embodied cognition where your body itself has an intelligence. Your stomach has an intelligence. There's an intelligence all over the place. It's just that we don't study it in that way. We think of intelligence in a very limited way. So the non-rational is this um, gut feeling that you have. And I, it's very easy to confuse this with instinct, which we'll touch on uh, in a little bit, but it's not instinct. It's not just about instinct. The fitrah is a little bit more comprehensive than instinct. Instinct is included within the fitrah, but it's not all of it. Um, the fitrah drives people to address their needs when they haven't been satisfied. So for instance, it's part of the fitrah to seek food when one is hungry. That's part of your fitrah. Uh, but there is more to it than just that. That's an instinct. I'm hungry, I need to eat. I see food, I eat it. Aside from driving that type of behavior, the fitrah has this super rational aspect to it. It recognizes metaphysical realities. Right now, when you look at um, a lot of the discussions with regards to religion from a materialist Darwinian perspective, there is almost they've now surrendered the idea that they can get rid of religion. Atheists, by and large, you know, especially the new atheism that had this its heyday. Now it's not as popular as it used to be. It's still popular, but not to the degree that it was right after September 11th. Um, they were thinking that the problem is religion, get rid of religion, will be fine. And after looking at studies after studies and, and researching this, they've now come to the conclusion that you can't really get rid of religion. This isn't a project that is going, it's in vain. It's not happening. So what do you do? You try to explain away religion. Um, and so they look at religion from the sense of it serves all of these different functions. It serves these pro-social functions. And so you can't get rid of it. And so you also see... Atheists, there was an article a few years back, atheists having an atheist quote-unquote church uh, service where they go and they get together and they have the music and they have all of this different aspects of Christian observance without God because they're trying to have religion without having God involved in it. And so um, this, is, this is part of the fitrah. There is this drive. I mean, I know that not all of the listeners listening to this are Muslims. And for the non-Muslims, who are interested in studying Islam, interested in understanding the Islamic perspective, interested in religion in general. One question to contemplate maybe, and I'd invite you to do this, is why? What is it inside of you that's driving you to ask these questions? It's very easy, and I think it's too simple to say, well, it's all around. 
you know, there's all of this politics and all of these, you know, terrorist groups and such and such and, and the debate between religion and science and all of that. That's too simple. There is something deeper than that that drives this quest to finding out these big questions about the meaning of life and the nature of existence and why are we here and why is there something rather than nothing. And these questions that occupy and have occupied the minds of mankind since the very beginning. Any society that you go to right now, regardless of where it is in the world, regardless of how advanced it is, you find elements of spirituality, especially the primitive ones. That's really interesting. Especially the primitive ones, you find all of these elements of spiritual understanding. There is this, you know, if you look at some anthropology's uh, anthropological findings, you find that even primitive societies, hunter-gatherers, they were burying their dead and, and carrying out rituals in recognition of something greater, that this individual that passed away, they merely transitioned. So there is the soul. The body is now dead. The body is perished. But the person it, himself or herself has not perished necessarily. It's only later that you find this accrual of uh, knowledge and, and power dynamics and such and, and, and uh, increasing complexity of theological paradigms that you find uh, differences that might try to do away with the soul, for example, which like we're covering right now in uh, Soul Machine for Andalus Book Club. Now, this issue with regards to um, instinct and fitrah and knowledge and what is the search from and all, that touches on a, an old, a very old debate in philosophy between what is called rationalism and empiricism. And this is really a debate about the sources of knowledge. I did cover this in depth uh, to some degree um, in uh, a couple of other series that I've done. There's one available for free that you guys can check out with Theology, The Creed of Deliverance. It's a playlist that you can find on SoundCloud and in YouTube on my channel there. And um, in Andalus Book Club, I covered this question a little bit as well in uh, the Philosophy of Science series that you can find in the video section. But just briefly, for those who are unaware of this or don't have a background in this, uh, just to give you the workings of it, what is it to be a rationalist and what does it mean to be an empiricist? Because we hear these terms, and especially when it comes to rationalists, it's being thrown around kind of willy-nilly without really much scrupulousness. And uh, religious people are being accused of irrationalism when in fact it's actually the opposite. There are really three claims that rationalists make. And for you to be a rationalist, you basically just accept one of them. You just have to accept one of them and you'll be called a rationalist, philosophically speaking. The first one is what is called the intuition deduction thesis. And in the intuition deduction thesis, some propositions in a particular subject area are knowable by us through intuition alone. That's the thesis being proposed here. And others are knowable by being deduced from intuited propositions. Now, intuition is a form of a rational insight. So, for example, we intuit that three is greater than two. There is really, this is not information you get from sense data. This is something that you already intuitively understand. One can say that, well, I can bring you three objects and two objects and compare them to each other, and then you can come to the conclusion that three is greater than two, but I can tell you, well, if I give you a million and a billion, which is greater? You know, you don't have them in front of you, but you just intuit that a billion is definitely greater than a million. We also intuit that three is a prime number. That's another intuition that we have. By deduction from that, we can say from these two pieces of information that there is a prime number greater than two. All this is just intuition. This type of knowledge is called a priori knowledge. A priori in the sense to say that it's gained independently of sense experience. It's something that I know before I go out and do any tests. It's basically what mathematics is. So if you're dealing in pure mathematics, you're dealing in the area of intuition deduction. You are a pure rationalist. This is the area of pure reason. And interestingly enough, and we'll, maybe we'll touch on this a bit uh, when we talk about empiricists, it's actually what empiricists rely on to prove their claims. 
as Aristotle, there's a quote by Aristotle. I'm not sure if it's really him that said it. You know how the internet goes with their quotes. You should just uh, a side note. Whenever you see quotes on the internet, get into the habit of checking if the person actually said that or not. And a lot of times you'll find that that didn't happen. Anyways, it is purported to have been uh, attributed to uh, Aristotle that he said, science without mathematics is not science. And that's really what we do in science. I mean, if I want to prove a claim, if I want to uh, give evidence for my proposal that it is true for whatever, I have to provide mathematical proofs. I have to do the statistics. I have to run these algorithms. It's all numbers. And through these numbers, which are relying on pure reason and logical deduction, we come to the conclusion whether my hypothesis has been disproven or proven. So mathematics is really important, but mathematics is an area of pure reason, and that's how we judge our empirical claims. The second thesis, or the second claim that you could, if you don't want to go with the intuition deduction thesis, you can go with the innate knowledge thesis, which says we have knowledge of some truths in a particular subject area as part of our rational nature. So this is similar to the intuition deduction thesis in uh, uh, the innate thesis here asserts the existence of knowledge a priori, independently of experience. The difference between the two is in how this knowledge is gained. For the intuition deduction thesis, the first claim, it says intuition and subsequent deductive reasoning is how you get knowledge. The innate knowledge thesis, the second claim, offers our rational nature. So our innate knowledge is not learned through either sense experience or intuition and deduction. It's just part of our nature. We're born with it. Experiences may trigger a process by which we bring this knowledge to consciousness, but they do not provide the knowledge itself. So you already have it. The idea of the tabula rasa, the blank slate, you would reject that. You would say, no, I'm born with this information. Some empiricists have tried to kind of amalgamate the two and say, okay, well, maybe it's through, or like Darwinian evolutionists. They'll tell you, okay, it was imprinted through evolution that we have this knowledge, and it's what allowed us to survive, and the individuals of our spe species that survived and evolved, these are the ones that had this knowledge implanted in them, and so we're born with it. If you look into a lot of the research, the available research from, especially from behavioral psychology, children's psychology, you find that that doesn't really hold up that well. The innate concept thesis, on the other hand, we have some of the concepts we employ in a particular subject area as part of our rational nature. So for this third claim, if you go, if you reject the first two claims and say, oh, what's the third claim? You think that our concepts are not gained from experience. They're part of our rational nature in such a way that while sense experience may trigger a process, to which they're brought into consciousness, experience does not provide the concepts or determine the information they contain. In other words, when you look at nature and you identify patterns or you look at things and you identify their abstract concepts or how they fit in a particular paradigm, the reason you're able to do that, according to this claim, is that these concepts are already implanted in your mind. They're imprinted in your mind. You already have them. And so it's just a matter of you being exposed to the information that uncovers these concepts for you so that you can recognize them. That's really all that's happening. But the concepts are already inside your head. You already have them. Some of these concepts, as they're not gained from experience, um, uh, it's, it's difficult to... This is more of a platonic type of position to have. So Plato's with his abstract realm with absolutes. And that's really where it comes down to the difference between a rational and empiricist. The rationalist will say there is something called absolute knowledge. Otherwise, it's not called knowledge. It has to be sustained over time and unchanging. The empiricist, on the other hand, they espouse that we have no source of knowledge in any subject area or the concepts we use in it other than sense experience. Sense experience is the only source of knowledge that we have. So for the empiricist, one, co one consequence of being an empiricist is that you can never, ever claim to have absolute knowledge. So it's kind of funny if you think about the difference between the two. Um, 
a rationalist will tell you that um, the intuitions that I have or the concepts that I have, these are absolute, these can never change. And so the, only the rationalists will claim absolute knowledge about something and say this is never changing. So for example, a religious person will talk about the existence of God as uh, through all of these pure reason first principles, um, especially from the intuition deduction thesis based on that. And they'll say, this is absolute. This is not changing. People ask, like, is there anything that you could be presented with that could change your mind about the existence of God? If you're a rationalist and a true rationalist, you would say, no, there's nothing you can present me with. Because if for me to reject the existence of God at this point means I have to reject my position with regards to the sources of knowledge. I have to reject my own intuitions. I actually have to become an, a non-rational person. It's kind of funny when you think about it that way because people of faith, people of religion are being accused by new atheists today of being irrational when in fact they are as rational as can be. They're just being true to their principles with it and they just said, according to my first principles of pure reason, this is a God is a necessary being. The empiricists on the other hand, they're the ones that, uh, for example, when it comes to various theories in science, they claim absolute knowledge about. So you'll hear many empiricists, materialists, atheists, they will tell you um, evolution is a fact. The theory of evolution is a fact, like gravity is a fact. Meanwhile, you look at the, you know, the major figure of empiricism, David Hume, he wasn't even that strict about it. He looked at these things as these are just habits of the mind. I've just seen every time I've thrown something, it fell down. So I've induced into the future that every time I throw something, it will fall down. That does not make it necessary that everything I throw up must fall down. It just means that this is what I've seen. This is what I've been exposed to. He was actually a proper empiricist about it. He didn't claim absolute knowledge about it. He just said, these are habits of the mind. So if you're going to be a, uh, an honest to Hume type of empiricist about things, especially when it comes to science, you would never speak about quote-unquote facts in an absolute way because for you... Sense experience. I'm always exposed to new information. Things could change at any moment. I can only hold on to what I can hold on to now, but I can never claim this to be absolute knowledge. What's interesting about this is this desire to uphold absolute knowledge. The drive to claim absolute knowledge is an interesting thing, which tells you something, because this seems to be a, uni a universal feature as well that we have something absolute about knowledge, that it has to be there. And if you're going to claim that, that tells you something about the fitra now. That it's part of your fitra that you want to claim absolute knowledge to some degree. The question, and where it becomes dangerous, is when do you get to do that? And how does that carry itself out in practical ways? So that's just the uh, quick... Uh, lowdown or a brief overview between the rationalism and empiricism. If you want more details on that, like I said, you can go check out the theology the series and um, the Al Ghazali Deliverance from Error video series and Endless Book Club. Back to the fitrah. Let's just talk a little bit more about the fitrah. As I mentioned before, um, though it shares some features with instincts, the two are not synonymous. You can't say the fitrah is instinct. Instinct is part of the fitrah, but it's not the other way around. Um, since we're talking about innate characteristic, though, uh, that we're endowed with from the beginning of creation, we still need to figure out how to distinguish it from acquired characteristics. It's not instinct, but it's innate, it's universal. We know there are acquired characteristics. How do I differentiate between the two of them? In other words, how do we distinguish nature from nurture? Now you've opened the door to so many different fields of study and huge amounts of research that you can go through where this question is debated all the time. Is it nature or is it nurture? One important point to keep in mind, though, is that innate does not equal inherited. There's a lot of uh, mistaken belief, publicly speaking at least, a lot of people when they speak about innate, they believe inherited. It means inherited. The two are the same, and they're not the same. When you talk about heritability, you're talking about a quantity calculated by behavioral geneticists. Um, these guys just give it a value between zero and one. There's variability to it. That's not a universal quality. That's not fitra. That's not innate. If it's innate, it has to be with everybody. 
when we speak of something being innate, we mean it's universal to the whole species of the, uh, the whole population of a species. It's an instinct that is shared by everyone. Acquired, on the other hand, it'll be varied. Some will have it, some won't have it. And that's how you know that it's environmental impact. That's how you know that it's they acquired it from cultural upbringing. They got taught it through education. Whatever the case may be, that's acquired. But innate, that's everybody's got it. Another important point to note is the difference between looking for universal human behavior and universal human instinct. The same instinct can drive different behaviors. For example, it appears that humans have an instinct or are hardwired for religion. Like I mentioned, you know, that people, atheists, try to get rid of religion. We can't get rid of it. The fact that so many different beliefs exist and religions are out there does not invalidate the universality of this instinct, though. You can't say, well, there's so many different contradictory beliefs, therefore they're all false. Or there's so many different religions, then there's no true religion. It just means that even if they don't agree or reconcile or reconcile with each other, you're talking about a behavior. You're talking about the manifestation of that instinct. That manifestation could change. You're hungry. Somebody likes to have you know, meat. Somebody likes to have vegetables. Another person likes to have junk food. Whatever the case may be, there's a difference in the way that the eating behavior is manifesting itself. But the eating, the need to eat is still there. And that is a real need. And if you do not fulfill that need, soon enough you die. There seems to be something similar with regards to religion. There is this need for human beings, and it's not just about pro-social behavior. Because religion, oftentimes, you find it that it forces people to behave in ways that are not necessarily pro-social. And we're not talking about terrorism or anything. We're just talking about simple things like you ask many converts when they convert to Islam, they adopted a religion that was, the decision to do that was a very anti-social behavior to do. Many of them lose their families, they lose their parents, uh, they get disowned, um, they get ostracized, they lose their friends, um, they start getting harassed in airports. I mean, if you think about the adoption of Islam, that is as anti-social of a behavior as you can do. So, there's something else going on here. It's not just about pro-social behavior. And Islam is one of the fastest growing religions in the world today. So what's going on with that? Um, that's a question to ask, and I'm just going to pose it out there and leave it for you guys to contemplate on. So to try to dismiss these things just because you witnessed different behaviors is wrongheaded. Differentiate between the instinct and the behavior. The behavior could be varied, but the instinct is still underlying it is still the same. That's part of the fitra. This brings up another problem, though. Can we ask about human universals in a scientific setting? There are some limits to that. How can you ask about human universals in a scientific setting, especially when you're talking about this um, a method of investigation that does not necessarily investigate all human beings. It has to selectively choose through empirical means. It has to induce and make inferences um, it uses statistics and it comes to confidence, but again, you're measuring things that oftentimes you're looking at behavior reducing. I mean, look at um, psychology, for example. What do they study? They don't necessarily study instincts. They study behavior. They can study emotion. And right now, if you go and search, try to go and look into uh, this business of human instinct and human nature and stuff like that, majority of research you'll come across is going to be about human emotions, human behaviors, um, and sensibilities and things like that. But it's not going to talk about this innate drive, this subjective drive that everybody goes through. There was a good book, though, that's written by uh, an American anthropologist, uh, Donald E. Brown. Uh, he worked at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And in 1991, he published a book titled Human Universals. Now, according to Brown... Human universals, he defines it as uh, those features of culture, society, language, behavior, and psyche for which there are no known exception. Um, these include a number of moral concepts and emotions, and he included in them some very interesting ones that are shared across every culture throughout all of time across the planet. These include 
being uh, having the ability to distinguish between right and wrong. So there is this concept of right and wrong. Even if you go in the middle of the Amazon to an un uh, com uh, an uncommunicated with uh, tribe, uh, people that nobody has talked to before, they know what's right and what's wrong. They they have this understanding. Maybe the, they differ on what's right and what's wrong, but there is this basic foundation, what's called the Noahidic laws. Um, these basic, simple foundations of what is right and what is wrong and how to conduct yourself in a right or a wrong way. This is shared across. Now, as you become more sophisticated, your list of what's right and what's wrong might grow, but there's always this basic foundation that people have. Another one that people share with as a human universal is empathy, fairness, admiration of generosity, the difference between rights and obligations, uh, the proscription of uh, the proscription of murder, rape, and other forms of violence, um, the redress of wrongs. So this concept of justice, this is a human universal. Uh, sanctions for wrongs against the community, shame and taboos. Shame and taboos is an interesting one. It's interesting that shame and taboos is shared across the planet everywhere. It just differs on what is considered shameful or taboo. That's where this intersection between cultural conventional norms versus um, uh, moral sentiments that are transcendent above culture, that are part of what is, quote-unquote, the fitra. This poses the question now. How do you distinguish between societal convention and actual morality? There was an interesting psychology experiment highlighted by psychologists Elliot uh, Trobelaria and Judith Smetana, or Smetana, if, and in it, if you asked four-year-old preschoolers whether it's okay to wear pajamas to school, which is, this is a societal convention that you would be breaking if you did that, uh, or to hit a little girl for no reason. So now you'd be breaking a, social, uh, a moral principle. These four-year-old preschoolers said no to both. It's not okay for you to wear a pajama to go to school, and it's not okay for you to hit a little girl for no reason. When they were asked, though, okay, what if the teacher allowed you to do this? What if the teacher said it's okay for you to come in wearing pajamas to school, and it's okay for you to hit that little girl for no reason? They say, in response to that, all of a sudden the pajama becomes okay. I can wear the pajama and come to school. So it seems that the social convention is amicable to change. I can change that. I can change my behavior societally if the culture says it's okay for me to change that behavior. But when it comes to hitting the little girl, even if the teacher said it's okay, these four-year-old kids in preschool said, no, it's not okay. So the moral principle subsisted. It persisted across time, across these changes of conditions. Now, the research looking into this highlights an interesting phenomenon which shows that these moral sentiments, moral foundations that are shared across cultures uh, among humans, it just unveils itself as the child grows and the brain develops a little bit more and they become aware of their behavior. These moral sentiments become more manifest, but they don't change. And this is something that's shared across. So back to this original question about human nature, the fitrah, where does that sit in with regards to religion? Like I said, I'm not going to be giving you answers to the, you know, the meaning of existence or anything. I just wanted to share some thoughts with you. But what I wanted to invite you to do is to, um, for Muslims, not everything that Muslims do or Muslims think is part of the tradition is in accordance with the fitrah. There's a lot of rich literature looking at the impact of culture. And in fact, al-urf, it's one of the foundational principles of, uh, juristic, uh, of jurisprudence, of deriving Islamic law, is to look at the cultural norms of a society and derive laws that would be binding based on that. Now, people like Dr. Umar Farooq Abdullah, Hafizahullah, and Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayah and others, um, they have um, uh, looked into this question of the impact of culture on Islamic practice and how Muslims conduct themselves. And if you read the travels of Ibn Battuta, 
um, this uh, great uh, traveler who was uh, recorded in a journal his uh, what he saw across the lands. And if you also read what Ibn Khaldun had to say about different societies, despite the limitations of their works, they do point out the interesting differences in cultural norms and how Islam would manifest itself in different ways. A lot of what Muslims think is part of the fitrah is actually societal conventional norms. Um, this religion is not that complicated. We make it more complicated than it needs to be. Um, and in doing so, we drive people away from it, actually. And so for non-Muslims, I would just uh, tell you to heed that when you're talking to Muslims, to pay attention, uh, maybe uh, turn your antennas up a little bit, perk your ears up for when you hear certain things, and ask the simple question of, is this actually part of the religion, or is this something that you just happen to grow up with? and you think it's part of the religion. One of the things that is, um, just to close off on this, one of the things that a lot of people are trying to make into a societal conventional norm um, is, uh, and push it to an extreme, is the business of the hijab, for example, for Muslim women, and claim that it's not on the Quran and all of this stuff, and it's just a practice from the Arabs and the Bedouins. First of all, it is on the Quran, and there's no disputation about that uh, and as a commandment to all Muslim believing women. The question is, how does that manifest itself? So you have this natural, and this is like a universal norm, by the way, that was founded. Uh, human beings generally cover themselves. Now it becomes a question of to what degree do you cover yourself? And how do you cover yourself? And what makes it a societal norm to cover this part or that part? And from an Islamic perspective, what makes it a religious norm? These are just questions and some you know, thoughts and, and ideas that I'm just throwing out there just for you to reflect on. Um, and if you'd like to connect with me and share some comments about this, please do so and, and send your messages and questions. Maybe we can talk about this a little bit more in the 40th episode when I do my listener interaction episodes. But... I would just uh, venture to, um, or I would just encourage you to be a little bit more cautious, especially for Muslims, with regards to what you think is fitrah in human nature and what you think, and, and, and not confuse that with your societal norms. This uh, is a big problem for a lot of us when it comes especially, and that's why a lot of muftis, a lot of scholars say, you should not be asking scholars that don't live in your vicinity. You should not be getting fatwas, for example, from somebody, a scholar, who lives, let's say, in Egypt, in Saudi Arabia, when you live in the UK or you live in the United States or Canada or Australia, where they have a totally different social situation, totally different culture, and that does come into play in the way that they interpret certain things, and then they try to impose that upon you in a place that sometimes they may not even, even visit it. They don't even know it. So, anyways... Before I get in too far into, on a tangent on this, I think I'll leave it at that. Um, but yeah, man, if you guys could uh, connect with me about this episode, if you have some comments and feedback, I'd love to hear your thoughts about this. And, and even if you have some resources, if you have some things that you want to share, please don't hesitate to, don't be shy to. You can contact me through endlessonline.org. Uh, you can try to go through Facebook messaging. Uh, Sorry for those of you who do message me there and I don't respond. I do get a lot of messages and I try to keep up and I do read them, but I may not respond to everybody. It's kind of hard. Um, but yeah, do connect. Let me know. Listener Interactions is going to be coming up on the 40th episode. So if you have questions, if you have comments, you'd like to give feedback, please do so. I'll be sharing them uh, in that episode. And finally, just a final reminder for the Endless Book Club members, um, to check out the recent addition to the video section and uh, keep an eye out over this week because the other parts are going to be coming out and there's going to be an announcement for the date and time for the live webinar where we're going to talk about Soul Machine before we move on to the next book by Joseph Messad, which is Islam and Liberalism and that's going to be a juicy one. At any rate, um, this episode is available through iTunes, Stitcher, your favorite podcast app, so please... Uh, if you're hearing this, uh, word of mouth, that is the biggest help you can give me, word of mouth. Sharing this, tagging me on Twitter, letting me know that you shared it so that I can reshare it as well. And um, yeah, man, if you're not a member of Endodos Book Club, 
you can sign up at andalusonline.org. And I think uh, with that, we'll leave it. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik.